over a hundred years they've been in this country, they haven't even got one instrument, a fixed income instrument to go and invest in. Finally, over a hundred years later, we've done it. Hijaz has delivered the first Sukuk fund in the country. Now Muslims have at least a fixed income instrument to go into now. We expect to be the largest selling fintech on the planet in about four or six months time, latest. And then of course, we're looking at cross-listing all our ETFs onto the London Exchange, going to other countries with our fintech and our offerings as well, our, our products and services. We're here to help everyone, not just Muslims, everyone that's, in, uh, that's really interested in ethical and ultra-ethical type of investments and finance. Again, what they're doing is uh, incredible and um, I, I've known them for, for a while now and um, yeah, great, great people, great human beings and yeah, I'm glad uh, to be a part of it. Sometimes we just focus on our sport and doing what we're doing and it's only a short amount of time. So uh, you want to make sure you're with the money that you are getting in that short amount of time, uh, you're doing the right things with it. So yeah, we were, obviously with Hajaz, uh, you know, I've known them for a while. I've did a, a couple of things with them and uh, they're onto some great things and uh, it's cool to just be here, be a part of it and uh, show my support. Sukuk are uh, the Islamic equivalent of a conventional bond. Uh, essentially, an investor uh, has a, a stake in the underlying asset that they're funding um, and can generate a return through the capital growth of that asset as well as the profit shared uh, with the investor from the underlying activities undertaken. Our objective is to make uh, Muslims have access or to enable access for Muslims to all the different financial products and services that the conventional market has access to, but that Muslims traditionally don't have access to. We've got so many exciting things in the pipeline. Uh, we have more funds, more ETFs. I'm really diversifying the types of ETFs that we're creating. So it's really about diversifying the array of investment choice available to investors, and therefore they no longer feel that they have to sort of pigeonhole themselves into a particular mode or model. They can be as flexible as innovative with the investments as they wish to be. Hello everyone, my name is Ahmad and I'm your host for today. Welcome to Hijaz's webinar, what is Sukuk and why you should invest in it. Our Chief of Product and Compliance, Mufti Muzamil Dadi, will be joining us shortly, right after we go to a, go through the agenda and a couple of housekeeping details. Today's webinar will begin with Mufti's presentation on Sukuk, which is then followed by a short poll of three questions, all of them multiple choice questions, and finally the Q&A segment. For this Q&A segment, you can type in your question 
by clicking on the Q&A button on the bottom of your Zoom screen's taskbar. You can do this at any time during the webinar as we will collate the questions for Mufti to go through during the Q&A segment. If there is an abundance of questions and we have run out of the scheduled time, we will collate the rest of the questions for Mufti to elaborate on them in a post-webinar follow-up email, inshallah. That, include, that concludes my short introduction for today's webinar, and it, is, it is, and it is with my pleasure to invite Mufti Muzamil to take the stage to kick off the first part of the webinar. Mufti Muzamil, please. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, Assalamu alaikum. Good morning uh, to everybody, um, and thank you for making the time today to join us. Uh, we will be sharing our slides shortly. So I'm pretty sure everybody can see what we're presenting. So mindful of the fact that obviously we're in the middle of a working day and, and those dialing in will probably be at work or have other um, you know, uh, obligations at the moment. So we'll, we'll, we'll get right into it. Um, obviously, you probably saw in the, um, the videos, in the intro, um, that we've, we've had the pleasure of launching our Sukuk ETF um, on the 1st of November in uh, this year. And uh, it was a momentous occasion on, on various fronts, uh, even from the ASX perspective as well. It was the first time that they had an Islamic uh, Sukuk fund listed on the exchange. So we made Australian history there and also for Hijaz and the Muslim community as well. It gives us immense pride to be able to deliver these really innovative market leading solutions uh, for a, a segment of the market that has largely been underserviced um, and the investment needs haven't always been fully catered for. So we continue to develop and innovate in this space. Um, a bit about me, uh, I co-founded the Hijaz business uh, together with our CEO, Hakan, uh, back in 2014. And we've had an incredible run over the last uh, nine and a half or so years now, uh, delivering um, all sorts of um, financial products and services for our target audience, the Muslim community in Australia. The business has gone from strength to strength in terms of its asset management capabilities all the way through to its lending division. Um, and in, in terms of our superannuation that we manage and everything else like that as well. So we'll go through, um, you know, a high level overview of, um, you know, what, what Hijaz does today and, and a bit about where we're headed in the future as well, which is very, very exciting. So in terms of just the sheer numbers, uh, we're managing over 10, 10 and a half thousand clients around the country, a portfolio of assets of over $2 billion uh, in, in Australian dollar terms. Uh, we have over 100 staff, um, largely based in our Melbourne head office. Uh, with a small and growing back office um, in Jakarta, Indonesia as well. Uh, very, very well credentialed and experienced in the areas of Islamic asset management, Islamic financial products and services overall. And we're proud to say that we are um, the pre preeminent provider of Islamic financial services uh, in Australia. Um, as a group overall, we manage um, various different products and service lines. Um, so uh, what we have is we essentially try to manage and control the value chain end to end. So effectively on our financial services side of the business, we have, you know, retail clients who come to us at any point in time for their superannuation. So they're going to our Hijaz Islamic Super and Pension Fund. They can also come to us with self-managed super funds as well as discretionary cash investments which are then invested into our um, existing and rapidly growing suite of Islamic investment funds. So those include an equities fund, a property fund, um, various income funds, diversified multi-asset funds, for example, the Hijaz Global Ethical Fund. So we're, we're all about providing you know, investors the choice and an array of options to be able to you know, invest into different products and, and to have different strategies effectively that reflect uh, their investment preferences and their investment behaviors so as not to restrict or limit the optionality and possibilities and choices for our members, which historically, unfortunately, has been the case with Islamic finance overall in Australia, with there being such limited options uh, relative to the conventional market. We also offer um, a broad array of lending services, which cater for you know, residential retail borrowers who are seeking Islamic finance, um, through, from people who are salaried in, all the way through to self-employed individuals. Uh, we also cover things like you know, vacant land financing, construction financing, development financing, all these sorts of different things. 
And I'm proud to say that we are the only provider who also offers a distribution of the lending products and services through both a retail direct-to-consumer method and model where our clients can come to us directly, but also at the same time, we offer that through our roughly 2,500 accredited mortgage brokers around the country who can be approached um, for Islamic finance and their, their financing solutions effectively are powered by Hijaz as well. So it's all about providing choice, accessibility and access um, to you know Muslims around the country or even non-Muslims for that matter who are seeking ethical and ultra-ethical investment options for themselves. Um, we are developing the, what we call the Halal Money app, which we expect to go live you know, at the end of Q1 next year, sort of March, April at this stage, which will be a real game changer. And I'll speak to, uh, to you a bit later a bit about um, what the Halal Money app uh, captures. And we also recently, um, you know, acquired a significant stake in the Islamic Bank of Australia, making it part of the Hijaz Group and a subsidiary within our uh, within our fold. Um, and that's really very exciting as well. Um, something that will will um, hopefully come to life in twenty twenty four to deliver, you know, a full service retail banking proposition for the first time to Muslims in Australia. Uh, we also offer um, accounting services, a financial advisor licensee or dealer group for those who are financial advisors who are seeking a license. They can come in and operate under our financial services license. We have a media arm and a very well followed and listened to podcast called Out of Interest. I'd suggest everybody to have a look at that on YouTube or you know Apple Podcasts or Spotify, wherever you take your podcasts and your media engagement. We have a raft of guests ranging from sporting personalities through to Islamic community leaders and scholars, um, you know, and everybody in between. So it's all about having a really engaging, interesting conversation to be able to, you know, take some nuggets of, of wisdom from their lives and their achievements and to be able to share that with our listeners. And last but not least, we we are proud to run uh, the Project Us Foundation. So it's a it's it's Hijaz's philanthropic arm. Uh, it's a charity that's registered with the ACNC. It's, it has DGR status, which enables you know donors and contributors to be able to claim back their money in tax as long as it's above uh, two dollars in donations. Um, and one of the really salient attributes about this charity is that it has a hundred percent um charity payment policy. What that means is that every dollar that comes into charity goes out for charitable endeavors. All of the overhead and managerial costs are actually covered by the Hijaz group, the Hijaz conglomerate itself. And therefore, um, whatever charitable funds come through, they are all utilized for charitable purposes and are not absorbed in things like marketing and salaries and overheads and advertising, which unfortunately tends to be the case with many charities. And it has long time, for a long time, been a very sort of sour experience with many donors who are very, very well intentioned, but unfortunately don't always see their money reaching the end deserving recipient um, over the years we've received a lot of coverage and a lot of positive um, you know feedback um, through various you know news channels and media domestically and overseas as well which is very very good to see obviously you don't set out for these reasons uh, to do what you do but it's great to be recognized and to be endorsed and supported um, by so many outlets as well similarly um, we've uh, won a lot of awards over the years, which further reinforces that, you know, our endeavors and our efforts to be best of breed. We want to be um, an institution that the Muslim community can be proud of and that is highly acclaimed and recognized uh, domestically and around the world for being um, for being innovative, for being creative, for being a market leader, for being best of breed and true to label as well. So these are all very important attributes to us. And uh, it's with immense pleasure um, that, that we are able to receive and share uh, these awards and distinctions. Now, before we get into the ETFs, particularly the Sukuk ETF that we recently launched, but also our ETF suite more broadly, I felt that it's very important for us to set, uh, to, to come to an understanding as to exactly what constitutes an Islamic investment. Because there, there tends to be some, uh, you know, some questions raised about that as to what what we mean when we say that you are investing in an Islamic or Sharia compliant manner. So in the Hijaz context, we have four principles that we apply, or effectively four screens that we utilize uh, in, in determining or ascertaining which of our investments meet Islamic requirements. 
So the first screen is what we call a, a business activity screen or an industry screen. Effectively, where we're filtering our investments that are operating or companies that are operating in industries that by their very nature are against the rules or principles of Islamic finance. So effectively, we're eliminating companies from our screening process that uh, primarily operate in sectors such as military, tobacco, gambling, uh, you know, conventional banking, financial services, all these sorts of sectors that are considered to be socially injurious or socially harmful, they are immediately removed from consideration in the portfolio. And that leaves us with companies that generally have a positive um, social impact um, that we're investing into. Then the second um, criteria that we apply. So think about think of this as a funnel. Where at the top of the funnel you have roughly about fifty odd thousand companies that are listed companies around the world that we can consider for investment. And then we are distilling and filtering those down to arrive at an investable universe of companies. So as I said, the first screen is the industry screen. Let's say a company passes that. Then the second screen that we are, we look at is what we call the tainted assets screen. So what that means is that we, we're considering the fraction of revenue or the percentage of revenue that a company is earning um, relative to its total revenue. And if the impermissible income that's earned by that company is in excess of 5% of its total revenue, then we are unable to invest in that company. So these are some examples from a few months ago of companies that while we were conducting our screening came up, for example, a company like Walmart, its core business may be Sharia compliant, but it does generate over 5% of its total revenue from Islamically impermissible activities, such as you know, alcohol, um, you know, defense, military, these sorts of things that are considered to be Islamically impermissible. Similarly, the um, the group that, you know, many of you may know as the Louis Vuitton, um, you know, uh, providers or the, the manufacturers um, of that, that fashion label. Um, again, their impermissible activities, which, uh, which range from, you know, alcohol and breweries and whatnot, that extends beyond 5% of their total revenue. It extends to about 11.69, 11.7%. So therefore, we're unable to invest in that company as well, even though their core business may appear to be Islamically permissible. The third um, screen that we apply is what we call, um, it is where we look at the interest bearing cash investments as a fraction of the market capitalization or the value of that company. And if the interest bearing cash and investments exceed 30% as a threshold, then we are not allowed to invest into that. And you can see over here a few companies like General Motors or Mercedes Benz, where their interest bearing investments exceed the allowable Sharia limit. And therefore, they are also removed from consideration uh, when we're applying our screening and filtering for Islamic investment purposes. The fourth and last uh, screening or, or, or criteria that we have is we look at the debt ratio of how much of the company's debt is interest bearing debt over the company's market cap or the value of the company. Um, so if that exceeds 30%, then again, yeah, the, the company is, is removed from consideration in terms of Islamic investment. So examples of that from a few weeks back, uh, Intel Corp and eBay. So you generally tend to find that a lot of these um, technology companies that tend to have higher levels of debt, they generally do not pass um, our filtering criteria and are therefore excluded from the Islamic investment portfolio. Now, if we, if we pause there and reflect on this for a moment, some of you very, may have varying degrees of exposure or experience in terms of managing investments or investing into listed companies. And I think one of the important takeaways from what we've just covered is that the Sharia screening process is an ongoing process. It's not a set and forget proposition. So let's say, for example, these companies like Intel and eBay, eBay and, and General Motors and Mercedes or any other company for that matter, it could be in Australia, BHP, Rio, um, uh, Telstra, whatever the case may be, these companies are operating companies. So they're very, virtually they are living, breathing, you know, organisms. 
So at any point in time, they have management meetings, board meetings, strategic meetings to determine whether they should be taking on more debt to expand the company, paying down their debt, whether they should be investing into particular sectors or subsectors or different assets or allocating their cash, surplus cash towards interest bearing or non-interest bearing investments, whatever the case may be. So that's an ongoing process for them. And from our perspective, we need to continue to review and scrutinize the Sharia compliance status of these investments. So by no means do we conduct the screening, for example, once in a year or once every six months and lock in the portfolio and say, okay, well, these companies are identified as being Sharia compliant today, and therefore they'll remain Sharia compliant for the next six to 12 months. That's never the case. In fact, you tend to find that there is a turnover in the portfolio that results primarily from the fact that these companies are their, their status of Sharia compliance is changing from compliant to non-compliant at any given time. So that's where, again, we're having to conduct this screening far more frequently. So we, we conduct this on a weekly, sometimes, you know, uh, intra-week uh, process to ensure that not only our existing holdings, are they compliant or non-compliant, but also at the same time, the broader universe, are there companies that have that were previously non-compliant that have now, you know, that should now be under our consideration because their compliance status has changed. So this is a very, you know, it's a robust, ongoing, um, you know, re repetitive process that we that's being undertaken all the time at Hijaz. Um, so that, that's always very important to keep in mind as well. Now, this slide before you over here is a quick summary or summation of the process that, that, that we've just described. So you start off top of funnel, a large number of companies, you apply the different screens and you arrive at a small pool of roughly about five to six, sometimes 7,000 companies that are compliant, the remainder are not compliant. And then you're having to go through um, the compliant companies and then review them for financial viability and profitability and whether they stack up from a financial perspective in terms of investability and, and whatnot. So that's, uh, it's a, it's a quite a, a lengthy process in that regard. Now, if we look towards the recently released um, Sukuk ETF. Again, being the first of its kind is great, but it also presents a unique challenge for us. And that's all. that challenge is all about educating and informing uh, the market more broadly and our target audience, the Muslim community in Australia, about what are Sukuk. Because for a lot of people, they've never heard of a Sukuk before. Sukuk is an Arabic word, um, and it uh, is the plural of Suk. Suk is a certificate. Okay, effectively a note or a contract that's exchanged uh, between two counterparties. So Sukuk is a plural of that. Now, in essence, what a Sukuk is, that it's an instrument that enables the issuer of that Sukuk to be able to raise um, money and capital to be able to inject into their business. Now, usually these Sukuk are issued by companies that are Muslim companies or Islamic companies or companies that follow Islamic principles, or they may actually be issued by non-Islamic companies, but that wish to attract capital from Muslim investors. So if they were to issue a conventional bond instrument, which is the conventional or non-Sharia compliant equivalent in a way of a Sukuk, they would not be able to attract capital from Muslim investors because a conventional bond would be in contravention or, or would not meet the Islamic uh, standards and requirements from a Sharia or Islamic principles perspective. So therefore, Sukuk are uh, issued. Now, what makes a Sukuk Sharia compliant? What makes it halal? Effectively, um, the contract that's utilized has to be drafted and presented in a Sharia compliant manner. So it effectively has to reflect an Islamic um, method or mode of transaction. There are various different types of methods um, or modes, models of Islamic finance utilized by Sukuk issuers um, around the world. Some are based on profit sharing, some are based on JV, joint venture, some are cost plus profit, and some are based on uh, a leasing or a shared equity rental model. So depending on the issue of the Sukuk, depending on what business they're in, different types of contracts uh, will be suitable for them. There are many very large top tier law firms around the world that are very familiar with this and that prepare these sorts of contracts for the issuers to be able to present to prospective investors. 
and most importantly, the underlying investment or business or asset being funded through this sukuk or Sharia compliant contract um, must not be in contravention of uh, Sharia compliant principles. So obviously, it would not be permissible. It would be very impermissible um, to, for example, issue a sukuk um, that invests or that funds a brewery or a, a casino or anything like that, even though that asset, some may say it's profitable, it's it's lucrative, whatever, whatever the case may be. Uh, you cannot have an Islamic um, uh, interface or, or, or a contract in place uh, to intermediate between an Islamic or Muslim investor seeking Sharia compliant investments and the underlying investment itself being uh, non-compliant or impermissible from an Islamic perspective. So these are the two principles that have to be met in order for a sukuk um, to be compliant. How it works, um, it's it, essentially those of you who are familiar with how bonds work, uh, you'd be reasonably familiar with how sukuk works. But effectively what it is, is that if uh, when the issuer wishes to um, raise capital um, to be able to um, grow their business. It could be um, to expand their, uh, their, their property, uh, to expand their business. It could be a manufacturing facility. It could be a logistics business. It could be an airline. Whatever the case may be, um, if they wish to establish, grow, expand, and they need capital, ex outside capital to come in, particularly debt-based capital to come in to be able to you know, support their growth, they generally go about issuing a sukuk. Um, as opposed to, you know, let's say going to a private equity fund or a venture capital firm or going to investors directly and having them invest into the equity of that business, they can issue a sukuk note or a contract to be able to raise um, from Muslim investors um, and provide a profit share back to the sukuk holders. Um, and once the principal is paid back, then the sukuk has matured and the, um, uh, the, the issuer, effectively the client, um, owns that complex. Now, sukuks um, are generally issued by both sovereign entities or countries, effectively. Um, you have a lot of Muslim countries like um, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, um, countries across Africa, various countries, Indonesia, Malaysia, the huge issuers of sukuk because um, the by their legal requirements, the legislator, whatever the case may be, um, would have requirements around um, you know Islam Islamic laws being followed in that country per se, um, and therefore they need to issue um, you know Islamic instruments to be able to raise capital, even as a sovereign as a country, but also corporates and and businesses that operate within that jurisdiction in order for them to raise capital and to meet many um, Islamic requirements that they must adhere to, they, they usually issue um, Islamic uh, instruments as well, like Sukuk. And here are some examples of that. Let's, so let's say, for example, Emirates Airline wish to expand, for example, their fleet of A380 airlines or planes, and they uh, wish to raise capital to be able to um, in, in, invest in that. Um, and uh, they, they issue a Sukuk that effectively enables you know, investors from around the world to effectively lend money uh, to Emirates or to invest in the Emirates Sukuk. Um, Emirates then goes and purchases this fleet of airlines. The airlines uh, contribute to the revenue and the profitability of the Emirates Corporation, and that's then shared back with the Sukuk investors. And similarly, you've got, um, you know, Saudi uh, companies or uh, Indonesian companies, whatever the case may be, uh, or even, you know, as I said, sovereigns, countries themselves who wish to, um, you know, take on, uh, it could be infrastructure development projects in their country, uh, it could be um, natural resource mining, whatever the case may be, that they're looking to do, they can um, issue Sukuk as an instrument to be able to bring capital in. If we look at uh, the similarities and differences, effectively, both Sukuk and traditional bonds provide a, um, a stream of payment, uh, of return, reasonably consistent, reasonably stable, especially when you look at it re relative to equities. Equities are far more um, volatile. Um, they can do very well under certain market conditions, but also quite poorly under different market conditions. And that's where people generally, investors look to invest in bonds, which are considered to be more stable, secure, um, and more consistent in terms of re return profile. So Sukuk have similar attributes as well. Um, Sukuk are also asset-backed, 
Usually bonds are debt instruments. So they're debt backed. They're backed by the contract, um, whereas uh, a sukuk is backed by the underlying assets that are being funded. So for many investors, they find that sukuk as a risk profile or asset class, they find it to be more attractive because they want to have some degree of participation and exposure to the underlying asset itself, as opposed to just being a funder of debt and therefore receiving a debt-based return, which is the case with a bond and a coupon, which is um, interest-based. So th these are all points to consider, you know, particularly for, for Muslim investors who have traditionally looked at bonds as an asset class for investment. Sukuk provide um, a similar uh, similar ca characteristics and attributes, um, but at the same time, meet the Islamic requirements um, as well. So again, in simple terms, the ticks and crosses sort of um, metric uh, from a Sharia compliance perspective, obviously Sukuk stack up and bonds don't. Ownership of assets with a sukuk, you get exposure to the underlying asset. With a bond, you don't. Um, return on asset performance on the sukuk side, yes. On the bond side, unfortunately not. Um, profit sharing in the project. You, and, and that's what the Islamic model of finance is really based on, where a, a investment return is always commensurate to risks taken. So that's very, very important to keep in mind as well, that if, if there's ever a transaction where a person is simply giving money and you know, guaranteed a return back of a higher amount. That is the textbook definition of interest. Whereas with the sukuk, um, you know, an investor goes in, provides capital, but there is always some degree of exposure to risk. It may be minute or minor, but there is some degree of exposure to risk over there. And there's also a, a variable rate of profit share that's attributed back. So it can be a target rate, it can be expected and forecast and reasonably confident in delivering that, but at the same time, it's not guaranteed. Um, and I guess just before we wrap up, um, a bit about the Sukuk ETF itself. So Hijaz, um, the Sukuk that we've, we've listed on the ASX, the ticker for that, for those of you who have your share trading apps and whatnot, it's, it's SKUK. SKUK once again. So that's where you can find Suk the Sukuk ETF, a bit about it, um, the, the, the disclosure documents and whatnot. But here in the next few slides, we've summarized um, a bit about the Sukuk ETF itself. So it has a target return of 8% per annum after fees. It tracks a global benchmark, which is the Bloomberg benchmark, highly recognized and very well reputed benchmark. Um, and we're tracking the constituent asset performance um, of that benchmark. Um, it's accessible to uh, as an ETF only. So without making without becoming overly technical, some of Hijaz's investments are available as managed funds, and some are available only as an ETF available through the exchange. So this Sukuk ETF is like that, where if you wish to invest, you can't come to Hijaz and complete some paperwork. That's not how it's done. It's only through the exchange directly. So whatever the preferred share trading platform is that you utilize, simply look up the ticker and you can find all the details there about the current pricing, the nav, um, all the disclosure documents, and everything else is there. And we have a management fee of 1.33% as well. In terms of asset allocation, all of the underlying assets that we hold, all the underlying sukuk that we invest into within the sukuk fund must be investment grade, which means that they are issued by a robust and financially viable counterparty. They have a low risk of default and they, we have a reasonably high degree of confidence in the underlying assets being, um, being you know, invested in or funded. Um, and we also work with, you know, globally recognized ratings agencies such as Moody's and Fitch uh, and S&P to ensure that all of the underlying sukuk that we are um, screening and including in our portfolio also stack up in terms of the investment grade rating. And that shows that the issuer is highly credible. Um, they have a they have a, a long history of issuing sukuk and paying these back. Uh, and therefore, we can expect that their performance of the underlying asset is, is, is quite high as well. Um, an important part of every investment strategy is, is diversification. We are well diversified across both the asset classes between corporate issuances and sovereign or governmental issuances of Sukuk. Um, and we're also well diversified in terms of geographic background. Now, as you can see, um, there is obviously a very strong bias here towards 
um, you know, Muslim countries or Islamic countries, and that's because they're the the, the ones who issue sukuk. Um, but interestingly enough, even though they are the issuers of sukuk, most of the sukuk are actually found listed on the London Stock Exchange. So you tend to find that a high degree of liquidity and transparency of pricing and whatnot that is the hallmark of a really well-governed and well-operated exchange like the London Exchange um, are then applicable by extension to these sukuk as well. So um, even though it may be a foreign asset class to many of us in Australia, we've never heard of it, never seen it. In terms of the, in terms of from a global perspective, the sukuk in, uh, market overall is in the many trillions of dollars um, around the world. So it's it's very very big. Um, it's just that in Australia, um, it's it's come as news to us, funnily enough. Um, our other ETFs that we have, uh, we have uh, two other ETFs that we listed um, last year, uh, around October, November last year from memory. So one is the Hijaz Equities Fund. Uh, it can be found using the ticker ISLM. So one might take it as a short form of Islam. ISLM is the Hijaz Equities Fund, um, and it is investing into global equities, global equities inclusive of Australia. So here we're investing into largely developed markets, um, you know, really well diversified portfolio um, across many different exchanges and um, targeting a return of 15% per annum after fees. It's available to cash investors, people who have discretionary cash, are also available to self-managed super funds as well. So if somebody has an SMSF um, and they wish to consider um, some exposure to uh, Sharia compliant ETFs, very, very easy to connect one's a share trading account to their SMSF bank account, and they can make these investments as well. If you require any accounting or you know administrative assistance around that, the team at Hijaz are more than happy and capable and able to assist in that regard as well. But obviously, with an investment into equities, it's usually a long-term investment. Short-term equities-based investments can expose a client to a lot of risk and volatility, and therefore, it's something that a person goes into for a medium to long-term investment horizon. Um, we also have the Hijaz Property Fund, which uh, goes with the ticker HJZP um, that you can find on your share trading apps or the ASX, whatever the case may be. And that invests into REITs, which are called real estate, which um, uh, the long form of that is real estate investment trust. Effectively, we're investing into pools of property uh, domestically and overseas as well. Uh, so again, really well diversified, very robust portfolio, obviously meets all the Sharia compliant requirements as well, targeting return of 7% after fees. Um, and, and I think, again, when a person's, you know, creating their investment portfolio, whether they're doing it for themselves or doing going to a financial advisor, whatever the case may be, it's very, very important to maintain, um, you know, a high degree of diversification. As we all know, market conditions, economic conditions change and evolve over time. And having a really well diversified portfolio, both across geographies as well as across asset classes, um, can be a really great strategy to build wealth um, into the long term as well. And similarly with our equities fund um, ETF, this is also available to cash investors, SMSF investors and super investors as well um, with a long term mindset. Um, I've, I've said it all along that our ETFs are available where you can find any um, ASX listed investment, you can find our ETFs there as well. So it could be ComSec, NabTrade. Uh, we haven't put an exhaustive list on the slide here today, but effectively any share trading platform that you utilize, you can find it there. Um, but we do have some very, very exciting news to share and announce for next year. And that is that we will we'll be launching our Halal Money app. Now the Halal Money app effectively has um, three components to it. It has the ability to enable users to, to do their day-to-day -day transactional um, accounts and banking through our app. So effectively, a person can earn their salary into the Halal Money account. They can pay their bills. They can transfer money. They can, you've got BPay, all that functionality. It's Google Pay and Apple Pay provisioned. So effectively, it comes up in your smartphone as well, into your, um, your wallet that you have on your smartphone. And we also have um, a physical card, a Visa debit card as well connected to that. Um, so that's one of the core functionalities that's there. Um, secondly, we have... Um, the we have term investments 
So effectively a 90 day and 365 day investment maturity um, that enables investors to go in and uh, it, it, it's similar to what the conventional market has around term deposits, but these don't have um, guaranteed fixed rates of return because you can't from an Islamic perspective. Um, so these investments enable users to have a highly predictable and transparent um, investment portfolio underlying, um, investing into income generating investments and peer paying them a periodic income based return over a 90 day or 365 day maturity period. And the third capability that this investment app will have will be the ability to invest into our ETFs. So we've said all along that uh, if you're seeking to invest into our ETFs, currently uh, it's, they're only available through conventional share trading apps. But once a halal money app is available, you'll have all of those, all of our ETFs available through our app. So you won't have to go into the other conventional um, trading platforms. You'll be able to execute those trades and make those investments into the hijaz suite and the rapidly growing suite of etfs through our app itself guided by um, a robo advice type mechanism as well that effectively enables users who are unsure about their investments to be able to answer a series of questions and then to be supported and assisted in making those investment choices as well so we invite everybody to sign to scan the qr code get on the waiting list um, a lot of exciting updates coming through on that front as well and we expect, as I said, for it to go live um, in Q1 uh, next year. So thank you very, very much for your time. I hope you found the presentation informative. Um, and if you have any questions, um, you can send them through the chat um, and we'll endeavor to come back to everybody as quickly as we can. Thank you very much, Mufti Muzamil, for the enlightening presentation on Sukuk and why you should invest in it. So right now, uh, we'll be transferring the poll to our post webinar email so we're going to run straight through to, to the q a section uh, segment and yeah so so we got more time to answer uh, this stream of questions that we have here so uh, the first question uh, we have Mufti Muzamil. all right all right Mufti, how did you come up with uh, this is a question from ali kereldin how did you come up with the 30 percent for interest bearing assets or debt who created this threshold and is there Islamic evidence of the permissibility of a company with, let's say, 25% debt ratio? It's a great question. Great question. Um, so an important point to note over here is that the Islamic principles that we apply, so these ratios that are being set, they're set by an organization called Ayofi. IOFI is the accounting and auditing organization for Islamic financial institutions. It's a global body that uh, are based out of Bahrain, and uh, they th their board comprises of many uh, you know leading authorities on Islamic finance. People like you know Mufti Desai, Allah Yarhamu, when he was alive, uh, through to Mufti Taqwa Uthmani, uh, you know many uh, Dr. Dawood Bakr, and so many others around the world sit on this board, and they. Um, collaborate and work with Islamic financial institutions to understand, um, you know, the, the challenges that are presented uh, to Islamic financial institutions, and come up with uh, these these principles. But they're, 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 these principles are set in light of Quran and Hadith. So they go back through the traditional texts of Islam and they see, okay, you know, what were the thresholds in the past that were utilized, and how can we make them applicable to um, in, in an Australian or in, in, in fact, in a global context. So that's where these things are set. And um, we, we are provided those standards and we apply those standards across all of our investment products. And the OFI standards, interestingly enough, are actually considered to be the preeminent global standards. So even though there are some, you know, different standard issuers and whatnot that have come into the market over the last few decades, uh, the OFI standards um, are the ones that, you know, have been the dominant ones, um, particularly across the Middle East and, and subcontinental um, Muslim world. Um, and, and these are the principles that are there. So in summary, um, it's not set by us. It, these are these are given to us, uh, but they're set by, you know, leading Islamic authorities, Islamic finance, um, you know, specialists and muftis and, and, and shuyukh um, who, who set these and, and we're going to implement these. Thank you, Mufti. Okay, we have an anonymous question for this one. Thanks for the information. So are Sukuk less risky than other investments offered by Hijaz? 
Um, it, it would be fair to assume that, yes. Um, considering the fact that the other the other sorry ETFs that are available uh, that are available on offer are an equities based ETF and a REIT or property based ETF, both of which are exposed to a lot more volatility um, and you know movement in price and whatnot um, through uh, uh, compared to Sukuk. Sukuk, similar to bonds, are you know reasonably predictable, pretty stable. Um, so yes, I, I, I would say that compared to other investments that he does has to offer, this is probably more on the conservative risk off investments as opposed to the risk on which are your um, equities and property funds. Thank you, Mufti. Another question from an anonymous attendee. I missed the minimum amount required for Sukuk, please. Can you advise? You, you didn't miss it. It's because there, there is no minimum amount. So the, the, the one big upside of having these investments available as, as ETFs is that you're able to invest through the exchange. So effectively, if it's, it's like buying shares in a company. You know, your, your only limitation is the ability to pay the brokerage fee um, through whichever brokering platform you use and the price of that transaction. So um, with, with the Sukuk ETF being reasonably new, the Sukuk price um, or, or the price of the ETF um, hasn't changed that much since we started it. So, um, you know, it, it, it's priced whatever is in the market right now and one can go and consider that and they can buy whatever quantity they like of the ETF. So there's no mandated fixed minimum amount as such. Uh, yeah, I think this is a question, follow-up question as well. Also, I invest through the stake platform. The minimum required for each of the funds still applies here. Is that right? Um, again, uh, whatever the if stake themselves have a minimum requirement or minimum trade amount for brokerage purposes or whatever the case may be, that's something that stake will impose. But from our perspective, in terms of investors going into our ETFs, we don't have a mandated minimum as such. It's not as if the ETF itself has been set up to knock back investors who um, have a particular you know buy amount or ticket size or whatever the case may be. It's um, again, if there are, as I said, if there are limitations imposed by the platform that you're trading through, that's something that's out of, out of our control. But in terms of our investments themselves, we don't mandate a, a minimum investment amount. Thank you, Mufti. Uh, this is a question from Said. Someone who has no prior knowledge about investment, et cetera, what should be the first step? Oh, uh, that, that can sometimes be a tough one. Um, Look, there, there is obviously there's a lot of information out there on the internet these days to study up and read up and whatnot. I think um, on the Hijaz website, we have a great deal of information. We have, um, you know, a lot of uh, client knowledge hubs, uh, FAQs, you know, all sorts of resources. And we're trying to have more and more of these sessions as well. In the past, we've had webinars, we do seminars, we have live events where we we we, we try our level best to educate and inform our community as much as we can. It's not so much a product push or a sell as such it's more about just general information um and a, a big part of our strategy for 2024 is to do more and more of this because on one side it's all well and good continuing to build and develop our product suite but at the same time we're mindful of the fact that you know a lot of muslims in australia are new investors first timers um who require some more support insight advice hand holding through that process so our team at Hijaz are, you know, willing and able to support. If anybody has any requirements or questions or queries about how to start, common pitfalls, you know, learning from others' mistakes or whatever it is, feel free to call in. Call in, have a chat with a consultant. Um, they'll provide a lot of general information about, you know, some of the do's and don'ts, um, you know, frequently made mistakes, frequently asked questions, and you can learn through that process. So for us, we, we look at it as a long-term partnership and a journey that we go on with our, with our clients. Uh, it's not a transactional set and forget sort of thing. Um, we want to go on that journey with you. And again, we, we, we take the time to understand what your um, requirements or biases look like. For example, you might have a particular preference towards property. So we'll say, okay, well, you know, why do you have that preference? And what's the property, where's the property market right now? Where is it headed? Is property a good investment? Or someone might say, okay, well, I only want to invest into, um, you know, equities or global equities, or I only want to invest into this or that, whatever the case may be. So obviously people come in with certain uh 
preconceived strategies or ideas or biases. And we respect that. There's no, there's no issue with that. But at the same time, it's always good to have that robust conversation and challenge that sometimes to say, okay, well, why am I so inclined to this versus that? Or maybe I've got too many of this one type of investment in my portfolio. Maybe I've got a lot of exposure to property. Maybe I should diversify away from property and consider other investments. And that's all financial advice. So we have financial advisors who are part of our team as well, who you can come in and speak to, and they can really go through that process with you. So, you know, there's, there, there are innumerable ways to to, to tackle that. Um, but it's, it's great that you're thinking about that because, um, making informed and educated uh, investment decisions is uh, one of the, the the best ways to make good investment decisions as opposed to just following the herd or sometimes, you know, you get onto social media, you have an influencer who's pushing a particular product and you say, okay, well, if it works for them, it will work for me, then we make that investment. That can usually end in disaster. So it's much better to get, you know, a qualified opinion, advice, uh, make an informed and educated decision about the investment choices that you wish to make. Thank you, Mufti. We got one more question looking at the time. I think we can take one more question. Uh, it's an anonymous. Uh, is this technically an equity instrument or a debt instrument? If the Suku instrument represents a part ownership of a pool of assets, would it be fair to assume it's an equity instrument? And how does that tie into the approved Islamic contracts like Murab Murabaha? Ijara, yep. Um, so yes, uh, in a way that that is a, a correct view of looking at it, where a sukuk is almost a hybrid, a hybrid between an equity based investment and a pure debt based investment. So it does have attributes of both. Um, and the way in which Islamic scholars around the world have um, approved these contracts is that you have this hybrid nature of contract where um, the investor invests in a particular manner. And there's a there's an agreement, a Sharia agreement in place between the investor and um, uh, the issuer. But then also the issuer has their own agreement in place between um, themselves as an issuer and any constituent parties that they work with in order to deliver that, 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 that those products or services or to grow their business or whatever the case may be. Um, so it, it is a very, very intricate um, system and structure, but it does have both aspects of it. We, on one side, you do have a, a, a debt-like attribute to the product, but also at the same time, there is um, a, an equity interest. It wouldn't be a direct equity interest, um, like you know, investing into the shares directly of a company. It's not that direct, um, but there, there are aspects of that as well. And that's what I think makes... Um, Sukuk quite um, you know quite pivotal to uh, a, a, you know the, the the investment portfolios of, of investors because we tend to find for example that let's say during the GFC um, where you had you know a lot of uh, pressure applied to credit markets debt markets equity markets around the world Sukuk ten that's where I think the the the, the, the Sukuk Sukuk really came into their own um, under those market conditions because they had. Um, number one, the underlying assets were really quite robust, but at the same time, um, structurally, um, they were uh, far more robust um, than a traditional debt-based instrument. Thank you, Mufti. Uh, looking at the time, I think, uh, unfortunately, we can't take any more questions. I think uh, from uh, the other questions that are coming through, we'll most probably collect them and put it into uh, we'll, Mufti Muzamil will inshallah, answer them in a post-webinar email follow-up. So yeah, uh, we'll be sharing the slide deck as well as the recording uh, with a couple of edits. Uh, and yeah, so uh, thank you very much again uh, for joining us for, in this What is Sukuk and Why You Should Invest in It webinar. And thank you very much. We hope to see you again. Thank you.